All right. She's such a good sport. Mm. <laughs> Here we are, and I still don't know what to do for a book. So I prayed, what do we do? Mm. What do you want, O oh Lord? Mm. And as I was out walking and praying, I thought about Psalm 139, and I got happy. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, you know, that'll make a really good study and meditation for tonight. So that's where we are tonight, Psalm 139. And David starts off here saying, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. So let's kind of take a closer look at what's going on here. So, you know, what I think is interesting about this is usually what we have in the Psalms is Hebrew poetry. Mm. And so you'll begin a line with a thought and then the next line or next couple of lines will either echo that thought or contrast with that thought or build and make some kind of a big statement at the end of the lines, maybe three or four added lines to the first one. But look what happens in verse one. Is there another line? See, there isn't. And David has a few of these Psalms where he just begins with one line and it's a statement. And he says, you have searched me and known me. So I wanna first look at the language and you want to notice that down here, this is a, a verb in the perfect tense, an action fully completed. So searched completely fully. And this word for known is an imperfect. And that means an action ongoing without an end in view, all right? So God is knowing David on an ongoing basis and he has completely searched David out. Now, look at this verb, it means to explore, to search, to seek out. Which one is it? It's it's the verb oh, here searched. for searched. Okay. All right. Now, just for kicks, I'm going to look up this word, word and see what we get. Because you know what the word search means. You were looking for your car keys <laughs> and you couldn't find them. So look at this. It means to look into or over carefully or thoroughly in an effort to find or discover something. Now, David says that God is looking into him and looking over him carefully and thoroughly in a way that is complete. Now, another meaning is the intransitive verb is to make, uh, 
painstaking investigation or examination. So I'm going to look up the word investigation. And that means to observe or study by close examination and systematic inquiry. Now, some of my uh, people here tonight are in school and they have to study. They have to study. Like you don't have a choice, right? No, no choice. They're shaking their heads. Because that's hard work, isn't it? And you have to learn things and look carefully and not miss anything. Well, God is doing that. He is studying David. So let's write some of this down. He's studying. Looking closely. Um, investigating. Right? But I like this. He's looking closely. You think about God as somebody 10 zillion light years away, as the song goes. That he's distracted. He's not really tuned in to what's going on. And what David says is, God, you have really scoped me out. You've analyzed and searched and studied and looked closely and observed. And this is an ongoing thing. You are knowing me. <clears throat> now, doesn't that sound funny? Because doesn't God know everything? Yeah. I mean, does he have to sit down and memorize facts and look carefully and say, gee, am I missing anything? Mm. Does God have to... employ great mental effort and concentration and you know what I mean? Like you get up done from studying sometimes and don't you just feel burnt? Yeah. And you guys looking at screens, doesn't that kind of mess with your eyes after a while? Yeah. <clears throat> well, here's God looking and looking and looking and looking and looking. So this is more than just memorize a couple of facts, we're done, move on. Where's the, when's the test? Right. This is God knowing everything about David, everything. You ever thought about that? Like, doesn't God know how many hairs are on your head? So it's not really because he doesn't know, it's because he's interested. Invested. All right. He invested in. That's the word now that's mean. really important. Mm -hmm. He's interested. <clears throat> not like students who don't care about their classes because as we all know, they have no application to normal life. <laughs> You're going to get out of school and forget everything you ever learned. And, okay, you won't. Not everything. Not everything. <laughs> but you do think sometimes, really, what's the relevance of this? But see, God is interested in David. Can we say that? So he says, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. Seriously? You mean David makes a move to stand up and God goes, <gasps> he's getting up. And then Dave makes a move and he goes, <gasps> God goes, you see that? He sat down. <laughs> and Michael the archangel says, yes, he did. <laughs> and God said, did you notice? 
Yes, sir. We, we all noticed. Now, is that important? Is that huge? Is that like a brain operation? It's not that big a deal, is it? So can we say that it includes all the stuff we would say is trivial? Mm, yeah. Like how many times did you touch your nose today? <laughs> Does God know how many times David touched his nose today? Mm. That means everything. You understand my thought from afar. Now, I have to do this because from to or at a great distance. That's what afar means. And I guess when I read that, I think, do you understand my thoughts even close up? You could stick your head right next to my head and I could think really loudly, do you hear me? And you would go, I don't know, you thinking at all? I can't hear anything. But God understands and knows David's thoughts from wherever. Now, I want to look at that word understand. I think that could be important. Distinguish. All right. Look at that. It's a perfect, which means God perfectly, completely understands David's thoughts. All right. Then he says, you compass my path. That's compass. Yes, that's a word we don't use. That's a King James. Yeah, mine there. says you comprehend my path. All right. Well, com is it say compass? Here's, what? As in like a compass? No. No, it means it's an it? old word like encompass. Oh, encompass. I didn't I didn't. It's compass, it. but I'll show you. I looked it up just a little bit ago. And um, look at the meaning here, comprehend. Mm -hmm. That's why. So let's look up. New King James for the win. <laughs> King Jimmy. <laughs> comprehend. And comprehend means to grasp the nature, significance, or meaning of. Mm. Understand. Yeah, so God understands David. He grasps him and his thoughts. You ever listen to yourself think? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> like you've had a lot of it this week, right? <laughs> and I've heard talk of brain radio. So there's music going on in your brain mm -hmm. and Things will pop into it. Memories will pop up. Mm -hmm. Associations. Mm -hmm. Dreams. So, I mean, there's, there's lots of stuff going on. And some of it I don't understand, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like, I try to understand bebop music in my mind. <laughs> and I can't understand it. It's really complex harmonically. But God understands. And you know, again, this is focus. I think, why should God even pay attention to what somebody's thinking? This, <clears throat> we are so far below God. Whenever I get to verse three, I always think, you comprehend my path and my lying down. It's like he knows why I do what I do. All right. Even when I don't know why I do what I do. He, All right. He watches me get up and flap around and then sit down again and whatever, try and focus. Yeah. He knows, he comprehends. 
He gets yes, it. I. Now, yes, I want to look I up. Do what I do. It's kind of a yeah. summary of that for me. I want to look up the word scrutinize because it's there in my translation at least. Okay. <laughs> scrutinize. To examine closely and minutely. We're in Psalm 139 tonight. So again, now path, everybody knows what, what path means, right? What does it mean? Where you're going, where you're, what you do. Okay. See, this is why you got a dictionary. It's to make you smarter every day. It's not just a trodden way, like the first definition says there. But down here it says, a way of life, conduct, or thought. And a lot of times in the Bible, that's what it means when it refers to path. So the way of life, the way of your conduct, the way of your thought, how do you go? What kind of a person are you? So would you say it's your character as well? Well, conduct, character. So character. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Character comes out in conduct, doesn't yeah. it? So this is the same idea in Psalm 23, where David says, he makes me walk in paths of righteousness right. for his name's sake. It's God's conduct. It's God's way of life. All right. And my lying down. I would like to look that up. The first person suffix, my lying down. Is that the only place it's used? Hmm. Let's look. Yep. Prostration for sleep. Nope. It's used four times. No. Baby has it formed. Okay. Well, you are acquainted with all my ways intimately. Let's look up the word intimately. Marked by a warm friendship developing through long association, suggesting informal warmth or privacy of a very personal or private nature, marked by very close association, contact, or familiarity. How about that? Now, look at verse, or definition four, intrinsic, essential, belonging to, or characterizing one's deepest nature. Does God know that? And it, it, the idea is that God is close. He's familiar. There's contact. So let's write some of this down. Intimately acquainted. Close. Familiar. With all my ways. Everything about my life. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Now, you know, we know this intellectually. <clears throat> but if you ever want to become odd, sit down and think about this for a while that God knows what you're going to say before you say it. And you think, well now, if, if God knows that, then why do I need to pray? <laughs> and yet we're supposed to pray. He's a God who hears prayer. But he knows what we're gonna say before we say it. God has that kind of knowledge. But see, David is writing about this, and he's thinking about it, and 
it's gripping him that God would take the time to know what he's going to say before he says it. That's knowing quite a bit, isn't it? It's knowing how we're going to respond to things. <clears throat> knowing our thoughts. Okay. So you're, you mean not only the words, but our actions, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. You know it all. Mm -hmm. Everything. He knows. He knows what I'm going to sin. The next time I sin, he knows it's coming. Now, I don't like to discuss that. We're not supposed to plan for it. And yet God knows. So it's not a surprise to him. Like he thought, well, you know, Rob, he's such a straight arrow, man. That guy is, what did he do? He did what? I'm shocked. I can't believe it. He's so bald. But even in that, the cool thing about it, though, is that it, he's doing that with you personally. But just think of the next person over who he's prompting to pray for you in that moment. Well. Yeah. I mean, I, I know evidence of that happening to me in my life. I'm sure other people sure. have as well. Think you know, about. I call my mom and she's like, oh, I was just praying for you about that. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like. Wow. And then he knows about that yes. for the next person and the yeah. next person. Mm -hmm. And everybody on the planet. That's fabulous. So God even knows the future. <clears throat> he knows my future. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Well, I don't know. Let's go back to the text and see if it helps. Now, that's a perfect, whatever it is, whatever it means to enclose. Mm -hmm. And it's used to mean besiege, to bind. Confine. Huh. All right. Attack. Well. Yeah. Now, when you what? I'm just thinking if it's attack and fighting at the sea, just because he's fought for us, you have enclosed me from behind. Well, yeah. I, when you're besieged, you're <laughs> enclosed on all sides. Mm, yeah. All right. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, um, Best possible way. <laughs> here's me. And here's God all, all around. And laid your hand upon me. So now, so that's how I walk around all day. That's how David goes around. Conscious that the Lord is around his hand is upon him. He's watching. He knows everything about him, everything he's thinking, even when he sits down and rises. And he know, says, what? Do you know approximately when he wrote this? I'm trying to think of when, when in his life he wrote this. Don't know. Doesn't say. It just makes you curious. Does, yeah. <laughs> Where is he at? What is he doing? What has he done and what is he about to do? Right. Yeah. Well, look at this. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Yeah. Too high. I cannot attain to it. Mm. So you think, okay, God is revealing something to David. Yeah. David's a prophet, you know. Mm. And he's seeking the Lord, and the Lord is impressing this upon him. Now, I'm going to look up this word wonderful, and I think that's important because it's this word, 
meaning wonderful, incomprehensible. Um, from the same as this word, look at that. Wonder, astonishingly wonderful wonders. It would, this word would, would be used to describe miracles. And he's saying, this is what it is. It is divine. It's something that is above me. It is divine. He's realizing kind of what God does. It's the same word. It's above. When Jacob asked what the name of the angel was, why do you ask my name, seeing that it's wonderful? It's the same. Okay, word. that's the angel that he wrestled with. Mm -hmm. All right. It's an and you know, there is that old hymn, "His name is wonderful." Oh. So this, it's. This is an angelic thing. This is a God thing. And he says, it's too high. I can't attain to it. I can't get my mind around this. I, I know it in kind of an abstract way. But to really grasp it, he says, I can't do it. Now, this is what I mean. Sit down with this, these verses, and think about them, and spend a long time thinking about it. And you're gonna find yourself hitting a limit. That's what David is doing here. Now, just for kicks, I'm gonna look up the word limit. something that bounds, restrains, or confines. It's like a boundary, okay? David has hit a boundary beyond which he can't go. He's limited. But what he's dealing with in, is the fact that God is not limited. He thinks God takes the trouble to, to discern whether I'm sitting or standing. He knows everything about me. He knows why I like my breakfast this way. He knows why I don't care about certain things and I really care about others. But God is not limited like I am. And I think there's a tension in there that I am limited in so many ways, in my understanding, in my vision, in my thinking, in my strength. If you think about it, we are limited in every way. But God is not limited like we are. And this, this is really what David is, is being gripped by here. It's almost like <clears throat> realizing God is, has unlimited knowledge of him, but he has limited knowledge of God. All right. Okay. God's knowledge is unlimited. Now, here's a guy like David who wants to know God. I mean, that's what he's about. Yeah. <clears throat> if he could know God better, he would. But he's reached a limit and just says, I can't, I can't go beyond this. Short circuit. And yet God goes absolutely far, far beyond how far no measure, there are no 
ways to measure God. Did you know that? So he resorts to things like, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Well, how far is that? Answer, they haven't found a limit to the universe yet. Because you just go on up and keep going up and it's past the stars. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your thoughts are like a, an unsearchable deep. So then he says in verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in the place of the dead, Sheol, behold, you're there. Now, there's another place to freak yourself out if you want to do that with your Bible at home. <laughs> this is another thing you can do to freak yourself out is to look up references to Sheol. And I've done this. And it kind of weirds me out because Sheol, the place of the dead, is a place that's dark and it's silent because nobody says anything. And it's not because they can't talk, it's because there's nothing to say, all right? Like, imagine you're dead and you wanna make a little conversation with somebody, so you say, you know, I used to be, and the point is, we all used to be, but we're not now. So there's nothing to say. You could have been, some big high mucky muck, and the guy next to you used to be some street sweeper. But in the place of the dead, there's no difference. All of your achievement is brought to nothing. So it's also deep. My goodness, can we not be legible? <laughs> it's deep. And if you think of God as high, then Sheol is the other end of the scale, deep. And away from God, you would think. But David says, nope, you're there. So if I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, and that's far away because the Jews didn't like the ocean. The ocean eats you up. Your boat sinks, you die. They weren't really super crazy about that. So this would be like an insane distance away and the wings of the dawn, the, the sun comes up where? Come on guys. In the east. Thank you. Is that what you're looking for? Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> Over there. So if I go as far as I can away, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. So here's David, and this could be anywhere. Heaven, Sheol, east, west, the ocean, doesn't matter, there's God with him, with him. No that is one of the most important prepositions in the universe, with. And like you said, God is knowing him. If I say, Surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. So, you know, I'm not super crazy about the dark. Does anybody here have a night light on at night? Nope. I know people that have them. <laughs> Not naming names. 
But some people are super not really thrilled about the dark. There are some people who use the night light for safety reasons, aren't there? Older people. So they, yes, ma'am. They ma go to the bathroom in the night. They don't trip over, which is very, very sensible. But uh, there's I think a wide so. use for the light there. Yeah, I'm not making fun of people who use night lights. No, no, no. I know you're not. I know you're not. No, it's not nice. And, you know, we don't use our Thomas the Tank Engine night light anymore. Oh. <laughs> You should. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it can get so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that mean God can't see me? Mm -hmm. See, darkness doesn't obstruct God like it does us. He doesn't need the visible light. His knowledge mm -hmm. is above that. So, you know how criminals like to use the darkness mm -hmm. to cover what they do. Uh, attacking armies like to attack in the night because then you can't see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't work with God. The night is as bright as the day. David is not hidden. Now, see, I would look up that word hidden. Being out of sight or not readily apparent, concealed, or obscure, unexplained, undisclosed? No. There's, there's no physical barrier that can keep David from God's sight. Now, I've learned that this is why God puts us in difficult situations when it becomes dark to us. And you know what I'm talking about. It's the valley of the shadow of death. And it's not talking about death per se. It's talking about it's so dark you can't see. And of course, if you can't see something, it makes it scarier. But you can read this in Isaiah 50, verse 10, that oh my gosh, talk about who among, you? who among you fears the Lord, who obeys the voice of his servant, who walks in darkness and has no light. That is, you can trust in God, fear him, you can obey the voice of his servant Jesus and you can be in total darkness and you didn't do anything wrong. You can be just like Job who says, I don't know what's going on. Hmm. And God says, let him trust in the name of the Lord and let him rely upon his God. And it's interesting that God doesn't take away the darkness. He says, let him trust in the name of the Lord. For you, O Lord, are good, ready to forgive. The name of the Lord is gracious, compassionate, full of loving kindness and truth. And if you add it all up, it means God is good. And what he's telling you is to trust in the fact that he's good as good in the dark as he is in the light because there's no difference. Now see, God already knows he doesn't change with the light or the darkness that we have. But what he wants us to learn is that he is the same no matter what. If it gets so grim, we're tempted to pray, God, just kill me now. Well, it's no difference to God. He's just as good, even though we're completely wiped out. So, he says, for, which is a word meaning because, 
You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Okay, and it's that word again, meaning to do something wonderful, extraordinary, difficult. It frequently signifies the wondrous works of God. So if you want to say, miraculous are your works, that's okay. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. If you ever get something wrong with you and you have to sit down with a doctor and learn what is your problem and you say, you're going to fix me, right? And he says, well, we can't do that. For your situation, we, we can't fix it. Why can't you? Because it's too complicated. We don't have anything that will replace what you just lost. And you go, great. This is the 21st and a half century. You know that every one of your billion cells has code in it. And code has to have a writer. There's no such thing as a natural process resulting in communication. There's a German uh, scientist named Werner Gitt, and he, he wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information. And he shows that information is not material because you could spell out, the Lord is my shepherd by mowing the lawn a certain way. Or you could chisel that into stone. Or you could make the shape of letters with electric lights and have it. Or you could do any number of things. You could, you could lay down ink on a piece of paper. It would still be the same information. That's because it's not material. And you can use different material to contain that information, but the information itself is mental. Now your bodies are filled with information that could not have arisen from natural processes. A mind wrote that code. So God wrote you. That's fearful. That is miraculous. Now, he says, my soul knows it very well. When you see the word soul, it's referring to the whole person, everything about you. That's why it's used in that context of bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So everything in David, he says, I know this. So it automatically moves him to give thanks. He just says, thank you, God. Thank you that I'm alive. Thank you that I exist. Even as limited as I am, I'm still a miracle. I mean, it's scary. Again, if you've ever had a system in your body stop working and you realize how inhumanly precise that system was and everything in your body is like that. You are composed of miracle after miracle after miracle. 
And boy, you don't really appreciate it till it's gone. And then you think about the good old days when you didn't think about it at all. Took it for granted. Hey, it's supposed to be like that. <laughs> but you know, if you if you understand this, you're going to thank God for everything that still works. Because you can lose that too. I thank God for the days when I could eat anything I wanted to and didn't have to think about it. Mm. Now it's like a, a voyage to the moon. You know, you got to have computers process it and get your trajectory and it's, it's a headache. Back in the old days, man, I could eat three bowls of frosted flakes and move on. It's like the days when I used to be able to see. Amen. Amen. You see? Well, it's a little bit weepy, but that's still matter. It's just making me think about 19 years. It's all right. Yeah. I love this psalm. It's all right. I'm enjoying this. Good. Um, but, but you're yeah. right, you know, these things, you, and you have to grieve for what you've lost. Too. Well, um, and you can um, thank God that it's through. temporary, it's, too. Absolutely, absolutely. God helps you through. You can, you can come to a bit where you sort of can't, can't even pray, but there's one thing I found at the time. There are other people doing your praying for you, helping you on your journey. That's what, uh, what I've been through, you know, but, um, yep. which is extremely helpful. But, um, yes, ma'am. You know yeah, what? The exactly. first thing you're going to see yeah. is the face of God. Absolutely. I think that's going to make up for everything else. Yep, yep. And I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> well, you can eat what you like. <laughs> yes. I've got that one slightly as well, because I've got a dairy intolerance. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, right now it's a discipline. We have to live Absolutely. under discipline. Yep. But, it doesn't you know, do then we're going to have in that respect, though. It yes, doesn't do us any harm in that respect, does it? Makes us, oh. When it makes us think what we're doing. That's it's good for you. Mm, yeah. Mm. So anyway, <laughs> it's a good thing to give thanks for, take stock yes. of where you're at and give thanks. Yeah. Give thanks for all things, no matter how awful they might be. Actually, that right. can often make you look at it in a different way as well. Not to I appreciate think so. it. Well, why should life be brilliant all the time anyway? But I mean, most people have difficulties of some sort, don't they? They're yes, ma'am. One thing, yeah. Hmm. Now, verse 15 says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Mm -hmm. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not yet one of them. Now, I'm not going to jump off the deep end when we talk about predestination. We talk about election, the choice of God, the foreknowledge of God. You know, all that stuff comes under a heading of things too difficult for me. There are certain things that we're not meant to fuss with. God lets us know. Mm. And really, things like predestination and choice and foreknowledge are only comforting for people who are trusting in Jesus. Mm. Everybody else is bothered by them, but then what's their big problem? They don't believe in God anyway. So why should they be bothered about that? And you can fix it really easily. If you're bothered that God did not choose you, trust in Jesus, and you will find that he will choose you. So it's really not that big a deal. But here's God looking at my unformed substance. What is that? Is that my soul? And God already wrote the facts of my life down in his book. I guess that means God knows the ending, huh? Now, I have kind of a bad habit. 
is I go to the end of the book and I read the ending first. And a lot of times I don't know who the main players are. Oh, gee. No, I just, it, it's really kind of perverse. I don't know why I do that. Yeah, you're not the only one. I think other people do that. All right. Personally, I well, don't, but uh, I know I've heard of people that do. All right. See, it's a comfort to find out a, at least if we're weird, there's a bunch of us. <laughs> Yeah. 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 All right. No, I reread books, but exactly. but yeah, yeah, no. Okay. God already knows, and I'm thankful about that. He gives us a reason to hope and to expect good. That's what hope means. Hope doesn't mean I'm expecting the worst. That's the called dread. Of the days mm. Ordained for me. Yeah. That's a specific number. Our life here is temporary. And I think it's good to, to think about that and think about the end. And think about where we're going. Think about death. Because it's going to sober you. And it says, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Do we want to just live like we're going to be here forever and just whoop it up? Or what is the purpose of our lives? And see, we can pray and ask God, make me the person that you want me to be. Start now. And God will do that because he already knows. He does not have to guess. And I don't think I'm done yet. So I can pray that. Keep doing your work in me and make me that person. Because what God wants is better than what I want. I could work and think and plan and really work hard on what I think would be great for me. And it is pathetic in comparison to what God wants. <laughs> what he wants is better. His will is good, acceptable, and perfect you can't do better than perfect. So David finally says, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Now that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Is this, when I wake, up on that eternal day? Or is it just, hey, it's a new day and I'm awake and I'm still alive with you? Yes. In the end, it doesn't matter. That's what you mean, right? Yeah, both. It's all true. And then that makes this fabulous. I am still with you. Now, in Psalm 40, David also says that the wonders that you have done for us and your thoughts toward us cannot be counted for multitude. I sat down one time and I tried to think as many thoughts about myself as I could. And I don't think I got any more than 19 or 20. I thought, now how can God think about me more thoughts than the sand? Because he's God. There you go. He's God. And that's what he's telling David. David, my thoughts toward you go far beyond what you can imagine. So you ever get tempted to think that God doesn't even know your name? He says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, what's her face? No, the other one. And you think, no, God knows your DNA, he's memorized it. He knows everything about you. He has completely comprehended all your ways from beginning to end. I like the phrase of that, um, 
back up in um, ordained for me, the days ordained for me. And you go, well, ordained by who? It's ordained by the Lord. Yeah. And the um, in New King James has the days fashioned for me, and it's just like shaped. You know, it's actually like clay. And like who's doing the shaping and the ordaining? It's the Lord. Yeah. And he's the only one that's in control of all of my life. Okay. Because see, we're limited, remember. Mm -hmm. But he is not limited, remember. We gotta live X amount of days, but with him, a thousand years are like a day. And a day is like a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So he's not limited by time. No. I am limited by time. I can only go forward. And you know, you're getting pushed to the door at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and then exit. But he's not limited. Two crazy answers to prayer today. One was in the morning. I was looking for my other hearing aid, and I didn't want to wake up Joni. And I'm thinking, it's got to be here. I remember taking them out. And I looked all over with my phone, flashlight, trying to keep it from Joni. Because that's one of the big rules in life, folks, is don't wake Joni up. <laughs> so I go, God, where is it? And it's almost like he directed my vision and I saw it. And I go, thanks. He knows where the hidden things are. Later this afternoon, Katie was saying, my fill bucket tool is broken. That's in her art app, right? So I can imagine, you know, a real fill bucket being broken. It's got a hole in it. But baby, this is a, a digital tool. How can it be broken? She goes, it is. It's not working. And I said, oh, Lord Jesus, please save us. Now, do you really pray to solve your IT problems? Mm -hmm. I go, God, please help. And I, immediately, she says, oh, my settings were wrong. And she changed the setting. And all of a sudden, the fill paint bucket is working like it's supposed to. And I thought, wow, that's two in a row. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. So God is not limited. He can answer prayer really quick. The whole day is like a thousand years to him. You got to imagine how patient he must be. All right. We go down here and we get one of the interesting verses in the Bible. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God. Kind of a change of tone. A little bit. <laughs> Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Now, people read that and they go, it's so unchristian. <laughs> and if they know the Bible, they'll, they'll bring up this verse and say, explain this one. <laughs> but if you understand the preceding verses about how amazing God is, and especially that God who is not limited should change or put all of his unlimited focus on me. Why would he do that? I'll tell you why. God loves you. That's love. Now, in the face of love are wicked men of bloodshed. They blaspheme God. They hate God. They rise up against God. Now, 
what David is saying is, you slay the wicked. Everything God does is just. And so David is actually thinking about all of the outrageous wickedness in the world, and it only comes from people who hate God, blaspheme him. They war directly against God. So, in light of this, they're despicable. I mean, you see what's happening with, uh, in the Middle East, in, in Israel, Hamas. And uh, I saw a video of, of uh, Hamas commandeering the humanitarian aid trucks and actually shooting at their own people. Anybody gets in their way, even if it's a Palestinian, shoot them. So you just got to think God knows and God's going to take care of these. This is David's reaction to people who are so outrageously offensive because they're enemies of God. So he says, you know what? If they're an enemy of God, they're an enemy, enemy of mine. So that's totally reasonable. Now for us Christians, what we do is pray that God destroys our enemies by making them believers. That's how you can bless your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully treat you and mistreat you and persecute you because of my name. So, you know, we can even say, God, you know, break the teeth of the wicked or convert them, one or the other. So finally, David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. You know that David does not consider himself the best judge of what's going on. He's limited. But God knows everything. He's unlimited. And so he can say, God, look at my heart. Search me out. The heart is des desperately wicked, deceitful. Who can know it? And yet God can. And so my heart, I don't get it. Why would I have an aversion to God in my heart? But I know it's there. Well, David says, hey, keep me. Will you keep me? Lead me in the everlasting way. And the, you know, the great thing is God will. He will. You're not going to keep yourself. God's going to keep you. We just say, God. Really, if he's unlimited and you're limited in all your goodness and in all your devotion and all your good thoughts toward God, there's a limit, but not with him. Say, God, I am now going to cast myself on your unlimited care for me. And God says, okay. Because he won't get tired. He has unlimited patience. That's what Paul said in 2 Timothy. He says, that's why God saved me, so that everybody would see God's patience in me and lead me. And you can trust God to lead you. Isn't that fabulous? Mm -hmm. You don't have to know the way, but you can say, lead me, and he will. Seems like when you're outraged about wickedness around you, it's a pretty important time to be also praying that prayer, you know, because wickedness.
wickedness gets a hold of me just as much as anybody else. So, you know, it's well, important to kind of remember. <laughs> you know, this is this I is mean, what Psalm 39 is about. Is correction as well. Mm -hmm. David found out he was one of the wicked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 39? Psalm 39. Mm -hmm. There, wrote it down. He was musing on the wicked, and he says, I'm not going to say anything, good or bad. And then as the fire burned in his heart, he burst out, and he, he, he realizes, I'm one of them. Turn your gaze away from me, lest I become no more. So I think you're right. I don't want to be an enemy of God. They're enemies of God. They don't care. I care. I don't want to be your enemy. Yeah. <laughs> so lead me. And God will do that. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be shaken. So that's what you do. You keep casting your burden on him. I think we're done. Shall we pray? Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you know everything. You're aware of all the skeletons in our closet, all the stuff we would die of embarrassment if everybody knew. And you know all the good stuff that nobody knows. You know everything about us, and you still want to save us. That's fabulous. Thank you for loving us with everlasting love. Thank you for thinking about us. Thank you for knowing the way in which we should go. Thank you that you steer us and you discipline us. You teach us. Thank you, Lord, that you do not abandon us, but instead you're focused on us. Well, make us the people you want us to be. We hardly even know how to pray, except you already know. It's written in your book. And so we pray. Make us the people you want us to be. Thank you for teaching us, for loving us. We commit ourselves into your hand. In Jesus' name we pray.